So uh, good evening. My name is Jeffrey Michaels and I'm the IEN Senior Fellow at eBay. I'd like to welcome all of you to eBay's seminar series on US foreign policy. The series is part of a joint initiative of eBay and the Barcelona Institute uh, of North American Studies. It aims to promote discussion of US foreign policy related topics by inviting scholars from the social sciences and humanities, as well as practitioners to share their research and provide their insights. This evening, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome uh, Philip McGowan, Professor of American Literature of Queen's University, Belfast, who will be speaking on the topic of seven decades of American studies in Europe. Unlike all of the previous seminars where we've had uh, political scientists, historians, as well as government officials speak about American foreign policy, and speaking as someone with a background in all three of those areas, I can say how refreshing it is for a change uh, to have an enlightened man of culture provide some very different insights about the United States, specifically about how the United States is studied and viewed from Europe and how that has evolved since the end of the Second World War. Now, when I first arrived at eBay and presented the syllabus of my US foreign policy course to some prospective students, one of the first questions that I was asked was why I hadn't included a session on how America is viewed in other countries, especially those countries where American foreign policy has made a notable impact. And so instead of just concentrating on how American foreign policy is made, how decisions on various policies are taken and so on, areas that I was traditionally more comfortable with, I thought perhaps it would be useful to focus a bit more on others' perceptions of the United States, not only in my teaching, but also as part of the seminar series. And in this regard, I've been quite interested in how the, 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 the evolution of American studies, how America is viewed at home and abroad, especially by academics. And you know, to some extent, there is overlap between American foreign policy and American studies, uh, especially after the Second World War, you know, the emergence of the US as a superpower and so forth. And thus, so a great deal of interest in many different countries at that time in learning about the United States and some interest within the United States to assist with that process, to to strengthen the links and counter cultural stereotypes, especially set against the backdrop of the Cold War and as part of the so-called cultural Cold War. And around this time, though probably a bit earlier, prior to the Second World War, you had the early years of American studies in the United States itself. And it's quite interesting, I think, to see how American studies has evolved on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and, you know, for anyone who's watched the American Studies Association evolve, uh, there have been, uh, there's been a great deal of controversy in recent years. Perhaps we'll return to that later. Uh, in many respects, I could not ask for a better speaker on this topic because as head of the European Association of American Studies, Professor McGowan, I think, can legitimately claim the title of the chief Americanist in Europe, despite any protestations to the co of his to the contrary. Uh, just to give a bit of background about P Professor McGowan, uh, since 2016, he has been president of the European Association of American Studies. He's a former chair of the Irish Association for American Studies and has been a member of the executive board of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Society since 2005. His research and teaching interests include 20th century American poetry, contemporary American fiction, as well as film. He also has wider interests in revolutionary America, the American 19th century, Westerns, and American narratives of addiction and alcohol control. In the field of poetry, his teaching and research focuses on Wallace Stevens, Elizabeth Bishop, the middle generation poets, and Mark Doty. He edited the, he edited the Oxford University Press centenary edition of F. Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise in 2020, as well as edited the uh, Penguin uh, US edition of The Great Gatsby. Further work on F. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's short stories from the 1930s will be appearing in the F. Scott Fitzgerald Review uh, in, later this year and in 2022. Uh, so Professor McGowan, welcome to eBay, virtually at least, and I look forward to your presentation, which should be loaded up, be loading up uh, right now. Thank you, Jeff, that's very kind of you. Uh, and it's a real pleasure and an honor to be invited to, to speak at this seminar series at eBay. Um, I'm in Belfast, obviously it would be much better if if uh, I was in Barcelona. Um, but there you go. It's not quite uh, where I might want to have been at this uh, period in the, in, the, in the semester, but it is what it is. So this afternoon, this evening, I'm going to try and give you a kind of an overview of the European Association for American Studies, 
what it does, kind of where its interests lie, what what its networks are for, uh, and how it engages with part of the, I, I think, the conversations that eBay students and scholars will have been having uh, up until this point. Um, so the EAAS, the European Association for American Studies, um, it was founded in Salzburg. This is the Schloss Leopoldskron. Um, any of you who are familiar with the the musical, The Sound of Music, uh, with Julie Andrews and Christopher uh, Plummer, will recognize this building. And if you ever get to the chance to visit the Schloss Leopoldskron in Salzburg, I definitely recommend it. It's absolutely stunning. Um, the European Association was founded in 1954, and its aims and objectives, as you can see there, are to encourage the study of and research in all areas of American culture and society, and to promote cooperation and intercommunication between European scholars of the United States from all parts of Europe and from various disciplines. The the history of the European Association is it's kind of interesting in that it sort of maps on to um, a number of uh, other European, um, sorry, just got a text message there. I needed. Sorry, uh, it maps on to sort of other developments within Europe um, in terms of European expansion of the European economic community which became the EU uh, and uh, Sorry, someone's texting me and I need to get them to stop it. Right, that should do it. Um, so the, the wider response of the EU, but the, the European Association for American Studies is, is actually bigger than that because we, we also bring in Russia, we've got an association in Belarus, we've got an association in Turkey, as well as across the Balkan countries, and that's quite a recent addition. And I'll go through the list of member associations in a moment, but we brought in the Balkan countries of Southeastern Europe in around 2014-15. Um, so we're kind of a, a bigger entity than just a, a kind of EU-based um, organization might suggest. Now, if I go through to my, so the certain articles of association, the, even though we're founded in Austria, we are seated and registered within Germany for tax reasons. And one of the objectives of the European Association uh, is to, oh, sorry, people should really listen when you say don't text me. Anyway, um, the, the propagation and extension of knowledge about the United States uh, of America. The association endorses no political agenda and is not liable for the opinions of its members. It encourages an exchange of ideas and endeavors to assure fair representation of diverse opinions and intellectual activities. Um, that no political agenda aspect is, is quite key, I think, to, to the kind of EAAS that is handed down from president to president and EAAS board to board every few years. So it is somewhat complicated, I think, in recent times, certainly when the other guy was president in the White House, it was quite difficult not to necessarily maybe take a stance about issues in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, the George Floyd murder, obviously, as well. So that there have been issues in recent times in the United States where it's very difficult for an association of academics that supports academic freedom uh, not to take some sort of political stance. We support academic freedom, obviously, and intellectual curiosity, and as an association, multinational transnational initiatives in the varied fields of American studies. No association like ours though, or just like no discipline or no academic field really, none of these remain static or autonomous. The EAAS of 2021 is a very different entity to the one that was first convened 67 years ago in 1954. If I go back a little bit, the European Association for American Studies, though, wasn't the first iteration of an American studies policy, I'm using that term advisedly, of an American studies policy in Europe after World War II. 
So Senator James William Fulbright, who uh, I'm sure is quite well known to all of you from Arkansas, uh, he made a, a, a massive contribution to the idea of promoting American studies in Europe and sending Americans to Europe to study. He himself was a Rhodes Scholar at, at Oxford, so he was very impressed by that experience he had before World War II, and he spent many decades in the Senate legislating and arguing for exchange and intercultural academic conversations across the Atlantic. So if you, if you actually go to the University of Arkansas, for example, you can go online and you can find the Fulbright papers. There's reams and reams of talks, proposals, policy papers talking about transatlantic exchange and engagement with the, the question of America or what America might mean within a European context. This, I think you could quite readily see as the development, the first kind of development of that American soft power uh, across Europe as the US moved from defeating fascism to confronting communism in the decades following World War II. When I looked through the last couple of days, I was looking through Fulbright stuff online, I could have picked any number of his statements on American involvement in Europe after 1945. In the Senate, he gave numerous speeches on this very subject, and he penned papers specifically on the theme of, quote, American studies in Europe. Right in the New York Times in January 1945, he argues for a new role for America in the world after the war, one, an America that was no longer isolationist. The US for Senator Fulbright should demonstrate in concrete terms our willingness and determination actually to participate in the burdens of peace as we have so magnificently participated in the burdens of war. The following year, in September 46, he introduces a bill to the Senate. And this was based on American properties overseas, and wartime surpluses that had amassed uh, as America was fighting in the Asian Pacific, as well as across Europe. And they had a lot of um, possessions, let's call them, that, that they couldn't bring back home and they needed to, to liquefy and to use the cash. And Fulbright came up with the idea of using that money for educational exchange programs. He proposes a bill that authorized the use of credits established through the sale of surplus property abroad for the promotion of international goodwill through the exchange of students in the field of edu culture, education, culture, and science. So there's a new kind of, in, in the immediate years after the war, there's an, a new emerging government policy, a state policy within the United States to encourage the exploration and understanding of America in Europe. And, and this then becomes a kind of rallying cry, I suppose, for a number of academics, in particular three Harvard graduates in the first at the top picture there. Uh, these are Scott Elledge, Richard Campbell, and Clemens Heller. Heller is from Vienna. Um, the Americans, you might know, were, were posted in and around Salzburg, so it's kind of made a, a natural location for the location of a, a, an American Studies conference or what became the Salzburg Seminar Series would happen at the Leopoldskong Schloss in Salzburg. So in this new environment of American engagement with Europe um, and under the European Recovery Program that the American administration was following. These three graduates organized a six-week workshop at the Leopoldskong Schloss, uh, which was called An Introduction to American Civilization. And they invited a number of important academics of the time, Margaret Mead uh, was one, uh, and particularly F.O. Matheson in the second picture there on the right-hand side, a sort of thin, balding bloke. Uh, that's F.O. Matheson. Matheson's really interesting for a number of, of reasons. First, he, he was uh, not completely openly gay, but was gay. Um, and he writes a book in 1948 called American Renaissance. And this was a key text in how American institutions and American academics were defining what American studies might mean, what an American literary canon could be, who was in, who was out. So that's you know, when Moby Dick uh, 
suddenly comes into prominence is around the 1940s, 1950s, as an American literary canon is being constructed. And Matheson was central to this. And he was the person who was invited from Harvard to provide the introductory lecture at the first Salzburg seminar. So Schloss Leopoldskron was the natural, natural venue for what would become uh, also the first EAAS. And out of this kind of atmosphere and environment of exchange, uh, we see the first roots of American studies. As Matheson says, their RH has had, to, has had no escape from an awareness of history. Much of that history has been hard and full of suffering, but now we have the luxury of an historical awareness of another sort, of an occasion, not of anxiety, but of promise. We may speak without exaggeration of this occasion as historic, since we have come here to enact a new, the chief function of culture and humanism, to bring man again into communication with man. So this is happening two years after the end of the Second World War, and in some ways quite a, quite a radical idea of bringing American intellectuals to Europe with some exchange students. And the overall, there's 96 people at this six week workshop about American civilization. So when the Austrian Association of American Studies is formed in 1954, uh, again, Schloss Leopoldskron seems to be a very good place to undertake this kind of gathering. Um, so between um, April 16 and 19, 1954, we have this very first uh, conference of American studies in Europe. Um, I don't know if you can see some of the proposed tentative subjects for discussion, but it's like the survey course in American literature, the survey course in American civilization, suitable texts and study materials. So it's the first gathering of American, Americanist academics and professors in Europe to discuss the topic of what American culture, American literature, American history might be. At this uh, first gathering, the very first EAAS president is um, inaugurated, is chosen, I suppose. Reinhard Wilhelm Zandvoort from the University of Groningen. And he is president for the first three years, between 1954, 1957. He's succeeded by the then secretary, Max Silberschmidt from Zurich. Silberschmidt um, stays as president for 17 years. So, you know, it wasn't a huge organization at that stage. Uh, Silberschmidt uh, is the longest, uh, longest standing president in the history of the association, though his presidency as uh, the head of the EAAS was in a time before we had elections. Now we have elections every, every four years. Um, I am um, the 14th president, the 14th person to be president of the European Association since its inception. All of us have been white, all of us have been men, uh, which is uh, something that I promised when I took on the European Association that I would be handing it over to someone who definitely wasn't a man and maybe not even white by the time I finish doing this role, which will have to be in 2024 at the latest. If I look at what we do now in terms of the American European associations, we currently have 21 member associations, the largest of which is the German association. We've got about 1100 members in the German association, closely followed by the Spanish association, uh, Edian and SAS, um, some totaling somewhere in the region of 800 uh, members. So across Spain, there's a large network, in fact, two large networks, of Americanist scholars who work not just on the United States, but on North America and the North American continent into Central and South America as well. So questions of you know, borders, um, questions of migration, questions of uh, security, um, drugs, uh, trade, all of those obvious kind of border and linking questions of policy are key to a lot of the subjects that are studied within the Spanish Association, for example. Um, so we have 21 national associations. They cover 35 nations. So I mentioned the Association for Southeast Europe a lot while ago. So we have in that, we have Croatia, we have Montenegro, we have Serbia, and we have Bosnia. 
Uh, we also try to bring Macedonia back into the conversation and find space for Albania. But these things take a little bit of time in a region which is very recently uh, arrived out of conflict, let's say. Overall, we've got about four and a half to 5,000 members. Um, kind of varies, hard to keep a, a complete map of everything. Um, but I suppose this is where I kind of come in in terms of the Irish Association. The Irish Association um, is an all island association in Ireland. So if you know your, your Irish politics and Irish history, you'll know that's something of a contested notion, uh, certainly since Brexit, even more so, obviously, for reasons that the UK government itself does not yet understand. Um, but the Irish Association was formed in 1970. Um, two people, three people in Dublin and one in uh, what was known as Ulster College, which is now Ulster University in Belfast. Um, 1970 in Northern Ireland, Ireland was an extraordinarily violent and difficult time. So the fact that academics came together in a kind of all island cross border uh, community of scholarship and intellectual endeavor is, is actually an, an enormous feat uh, and it's not to be underestimated and that they carried on through some very dark years here during the 1970s and 80s. I had the luck not to have to do that as president or chair of the Irish Association. Um, and I came to that role in 2011 and you know we grew the membership a bit. And you know, I think it was on the basis of that probably that I was luckily enough put forward to be president of the European Association. The president of the European Association is elected by a board member from each of these member associations. So even though Germany has 1,100 members, uh, it only has one vote on the board, just like everyone else does. Uh, and the Irish Association is one of the smaller uh, member associations and certainly the smallest in terms of uh, a president taking over the whole association. Previously, presidents of the European Association have been from Netherlands, from Germany, from the United Kingdom, uh, as well as from um, uh, Switzerland. So outside of that, it was quite sort of a surprise for somebody uh, from one of the smaller associations to take over, but I think it's, it's helped, I would say that obviously, but I do think it has helped in terms of the smaller associations getting uh, a bit more of a representation and a voice. Now, across these member associations, you'll find very different approaches to American studies or very different attitudes to what America represents uh, and how colleagues in these different locations will either engage with America or step back and critique America. So in the German Association, for example, one reason they, you know they've got a lot more members so they can do a lot more things but there's quite a focus on political science as well as american history um, and economic science whereas in the irish association that i'm from culturally we're more interested in kind of literature than in politics so there's a lot of the members of the irish association are are literary phds or, or teachers of american literature that's quite similar in the British Association, our, our neighbour uh, association, uh, where we get, you know, a lot of literature, a lot of history, um, less so politics, more sort of cultural studies film, but it really does depend. So when you go, if you go very far east into Poland, you'll find the association there is a cross hybrid of political, theoretical, race, and digital studies, science fiction studies is very strong in Poland in terms of the United States. Uh, in Belarus and in Russia, well, things are a little bit different, I have to be honest, in those associations and in uh, academic institutions in those countries where America is not necessarily uh, the favorite topic, let's say, uh, I might leave it at that. Um, we were in we were in Romania in 2016 in Constanza, right on the Black Sea coast, uh, when I was elected as president of the European Association, and it was remarkable how beholden to a kind of uh, 
a sense of an American progressivism that a Romanian academics were. Uh, they were very much taken by the idea that America is the land of the free and a land of opportunity and, and weren't that open to sort of critical diagnoses of the American experiment in the way that Western and Northern European countries were much more advanced in terms of that critique of the United States and reading the United States uh, in terms of its, its difficult histories, um, whether that's to do with slavery, civil war, whether it's to do with authoritarianism, as we saw after World War I and before World War II, just after, and most recently, obviously, uh, in the Trump administration. So depending on where you are within the network of EAAS associations, you'll find you know, quite a different slant on how the American experiment and how the United States are understood. And that, that's a vestige and a, and a sort of legacy of you know, educational systems. It's very, it's very easy to sit down and see where uh, an academic colleague's uh, PhD students have gone uh, and where they've brought that kind of influence and their critical focus on race or a critical focus on gender or a critical focus on literature. And, and where they sort of then pop up again uh, across the network, which is it's kind of entertaining sometimes when you meet them at, at conferences and you go, I know, I know exactly who your PhD supervisor is without even you needing to tell me. Um, myself, you know, before all of this, I did a literature PhD or kind of American studies PhD in Dublin um, in the mid 1990s. Um, and that led me to, you know, you know, kind of an affiliation with the Irish Association through a postgraduate network, and then you get sort of inculcated into the wider mechanisms of of what these what these associations are for. A lot of it is for supporting postgraduate students, and I'm going to go on to that in a second about some of our grants and networks, but it, supporting the work of new scholars uh, and emerging scholars and allowing them space to connect with colleagues across uh, the European continent and beyond. You know, we, we do also have EAAS members who live and work in Asia, Australasia, the United States. And um, so each network has, each association has its own network of postgraduate and uh, established scholars. And then we fan into a much bigger network in terms of the European Association where we connect all the dots. Uh, so, you know, we run from uh, the western shores of Ireland and Donegal right the way to where Russia meets Mongolia, all the way down to the Bosphorus and all the way up uh, to Iceland. So it's, a, it's an enormous network of scholars working on the United States. Um, so, it, you know, it is something that, um, you know, there's a kind of an, a pool of expertise uh, across Europe <coughs> that I think th this network brings together that, that maybe no other one really can. To give you a sense, when I was talking to uh, Jeff before the other day, yesterday, indeed, it seems a long time ago, uh, about, he, he was asking me, you know, could I give a sense of trends within American studies? And I suppose, you know, to go into, you know, what everyone does in different countries and locations, that's quite, it's probably quite tricky to do that. There's so much of it. But I thought if we looked at the journal, so there's a journal which is online, uh, open access, uh, the European Journal of American Studies. It produces four issues per year, three which are dedicated special issues. And then one is a kind of open, an open issue on, on any topics. But I thought if we looked at the contents of some of the special issues, you'll see kind of, sort of where American studies is, the kind of pulse of American studies in Europe at the moment. So the most recent one from this year, video games and or in American studies, politics, popular culture and populism. We had three last year, which were really well received. So contagion and conviction, rumor and gossip in American culture. Uh, one on Islamophobia and intermultimedial dissensus, truth or post-truth, obviously, you know why that might be the case in terms of American studies recently. Uh, we've also had 
special dedicated issues on Black Lives Matter, race matters, uh, looking back to 1968 and the legacy of the civil rights movement, um, and also you know, questions of you know, human rights, civil rights, in American visual culture back in 2018 in the journal. Um, it's not immediately straightforward, I think, to think of what people are doing uh, in terms of their scholarship and research. If I was to take a straw poll of um, American studies PhD students that I've encountered over the last four years, five years, um, gender is enormous. Um, and not just in, a, in any sense of a binary question of gender, but in terms of transgender, LGBTQ plus issues, race and the United States, and coming back to a question of understanding race through the lens of, um, you know, some com quite complicated relationships with race in Europe as well. Um, you know, the European involvement with colonial enterprises back in the 17, 18 hundreds, um, you know, it's not something that necessarily sits very easily with a radical critique these days. Um, but also I think, you know, the direction of travel within American studies is much more contemporary. Um, you know, I think a lot of the old studies that, you know, someone was doing a PhD just on Mark Twain, for example, I think that's probably, We've probably had that now. I think that's probably disappeared uh, from American studies, and and it's much more about the contemporary moment, about border studies, about migration, about civil rights and human rights, about gender, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, um, and and the sort of perennial questions of what America and the American experiment might mean. We haven't quite got to. Um, rigorous interrogation of January the 6th, 2021, and the attack on the Capitol in Washington, but that will be coming soon. I am absolutely certain, though, of course, with a caveat that uh, a lot of that is still undecided. Um, the committee into that insurrection is still trying to track down and get reports and transcripts of documents and conversations that were being held on that day and, and they're being blocked by the Republican Party stroke, uh, the, the Trump Party, um, for want of a better term. Beyond the journal and what people are doing in terms of trends, we have a number of networks. So when I, when I took on the, the presidency, we had all the ones on the left. So the American Studies Network is kind of obvious. What that does, Southern Studies Forum looks at all of those questions of um, the American South, borders, uh, Mexico, um, also looks at you know, questions of reconstruction and after in the United States, after the American Civil War, uh, a 19th century literature group. The Women's Network, I think that's probably the most successful network we have. Uh, it arranges a symposium every two years and last we met was in Greece, in Thessaloniki, when we had over 120 uh, women academics came together and talked for three days about questions in, in relation to uh, women's studies in the United States. Uh, and that, you know, that has grown so much because when we were, the previous meeting, we only had about 35. So that, that's the one that's expanding massively. We have a visual culture and media studies network and an early American studies network. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, postgraduates were looking for were other, other fora that they could discuss their work in. So we've established a postgraduate and early career forum in the European Association. Um, I've launched just recently the Modern and Contemporary American Poetry Network, just because I could while I was president of as well. Uh, we have a new starting network in decolonial indigenous and critical ethnic studies um, which is going to be launched in Madrid. I'm going to say a little bit about Madrid in a second because we're going to be going there next year. Uh, a new LGBTQ plus network was launched at our last conference which was virtually held in Warsaw as was the digital studies network um, which is bringing together scholars not just from the European Association but also from from the United States. I mentioned Madrid. I'm going to come on to my last slide now because I see it's 25 to 6. Um, and given that you're in Barcelona, and uh, I would love to be in Barcelona this evening and not in a quite rainy Belfast, 
Um, two things that are happening in Spain um, that are important, I think, certainly for Spanish Americanists. Uh, the 24th to the 26th of September is the ADIAN conference, the annual conference, which is being hosted online um, by the Universidad de Cantabria in Santander. Um, and I will be virtually attending that somehow uh, from my own seat right here. Uh, but even more importantly, I think, uh, is that our next general conference, the EAAS biennial conference, is happening in Madrid, 6th to the 8th of April next year, in person, touch wood, uh, on the theme of wastelands. And, and these are wastelands which can be, you know, quite widely uh, interpreted, literary and cultural wastelands, wastelands in the Anthropocene age, the ethics of waste, uh, waste of information, waste as negative store, uh, pathologies of waste, aging, uh, pandemics, all those kind of questions around waste and decay. Um, it would be great. Uh, there's a website there, and you've got the address eaas2022.com, where you will see soon the program uh, for the conference. And it would be great to, to get to see you maybe in person. And I'll stop there. <clears throat> Professor McGowan, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, that was a very good overview of what it is that the European Association of American Studies does where it's based, all the different individuals uh, from so many different countries involved. Uh, I, I didn't guess, I didn't realize the size of it or the scale of it until you actually presented it. So that's quite actually a useful picture. Uh, but also just the history of it uh, as well, going back to Salzburg at the end of the Second World War. Uh, also to see some of the continuities from back mm. then as well as the change. Uh, I know when we spoke yesterday, uh, and I asked about this question about trends in American studies, uh, I know it is unfair to ask for a state of the field, uh, you know, which is absolutely enormous, uh, and do it at very, very short notice and, and all this, but I thought one of the things you mentioned, which I thought was quite useful, um, yeah, for me at least, was, you know, it's not only the titles and the subjects that are, uh, you know, on the agenda today, it's also the ones that have fallen off from the past. You mentioned Mark Twain, for example. You know, I'm sure Henry James is not exactly uh, perhaps done as much as in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, hopefully with Trump, maybe there's a return to Millville and the Confidence Man, but you know, something like this. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but but generally speaking, there's more of an interest in more recent, contemporary, at least in the field of literature, perhaps authors. Yeah. Um, than going back to Jane, James Fenmore Cooper or something like this, which has perhaps been, you know, done and you know, we've we've seen all that. We can't really do very much more. We're much more interested in the contemporary topic. This this sort of thing. Um, so a few questions, if I might. Um, yeah. So I mean, one thing that you you discussed a bit when you talked about when you did sort of the survey going around Eastern Europe, for example. You mentioned mm -hmm. Romania, Russia, Belarus. Yeah. Oh. I'm sort of wondering, you know, just from either your own personal experience of what you've heard secondhand, uh, in terms of after the end of the Cold War and sort of the views from Eastern Europe, to what extent has American studies changed from what it was before, say, during the Cold War? So, for instance, if you were in Poland during the Cold War, or mm -hmm. you know, perhaps in the Soviet Union, or more, more recently with Russia, perhaps changed a bit less. Well, with a country like Poland or perhaps East Germany, uh, and you know Leipzig, of course, is is, is I think still a, an important center of American studies uh, in Europe. Whether there were certain critical traditions based upon, say, a, a Marxist analysis or something like this, um, yeah, did you see sort of a massive shift in some of those countries, or was there more continuity that changed? Um, I think it's interesting, you know, somewhere like Poland, um, which is on that kind of interface. Um, and has been for so many decades and centuries. There wasn't a Polish American Association until after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Right. Um, uh, and similarly in other Eastern European locations, um, it just didn't. It just wasn't on the map. It just wasn't there. So we were talking about, you know, West Germany at the time. Uh, very famously, Angela Davis, uh, American, African American. American. Davis, activist, she went to East Germany in the 1970s. Uh, and there's a very famous interview of her in, in East Germany in the 1970s talking about, um, you know, black rights, 
Black Resistance. Um, and that was a kind of a seminal moment uh, within a, a number of, um, I suppose, American studies context, because this idea that this, this scholar goes to East Germany and is interviewed there, uh, that, 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 was quite, that was quite telling. She also came here to Northern Ireland, like soon after she came to Belfast uh, and was similarly talking about civil rights here. I think the shifts that that then become, you know, kind of on on that sort of edge of of American soft power influence as as communism is pushed back in the 1980s, at the end of the 1980s into the 1990s. I, th I think it's quite interesting as you look across the spectrum of Europe. So those countries that have just sort of, you know, come through communism in the recent decades, they are still sort of you know they're they're still looking at James Fenimore Cooper, and they're still encountering um, you know James Dean and East of Eden and and, and all that kind of American Americana that might be dis, dis, discounted these days. Maybe has kind of been a bit kitsch uh, and not that critical. Uh, whereas in the West, in Western Europe, things are much more sort of up to date. I would say much more contemporary. Um, and much more willing to challenge that sort of uh, any sense of a kind of a monolithic American identity or a, sort of you know the American state being a state and a force for good. Uh, that's not necessarily where maybe things stand with the United States. I don't want to be too controversial there, but um, so I think you know it's it's interesting to watch. You know, if I had like a database, Jeff, of PhD topics, I think that would probably be the best way to do it you would see in each different country what people are focusing on at particular points in time. So there, there was a lot of work in Germany on the Kennedy presidency uh, and we have the Kennedy Institute in Berlin, as you know. Um, and and it, also, it also depends on the, the relationships between European countries and the United States administrations. So for my own benefit, I was lucky in Ireland in that I did my PhD in Dublin 1993 to 1996 during the Clinton administration. And the Clinton administration was really supportive of any kinds of engagement with academics, with postgraduate researchers, uh, giving funds to American embassies to support these kind of events. So like twice I was invited to the American ambassador's house in, in Phoenix Park in Dublin, which is a beautiful house. And the ambassador at the time was Jean Kennedy Smith. So like you know, one of the Kennedys sitting in, in this palatial mansion throwing amazing receptions. Now, when I was in Thessaloniki a couple of years ago for the European Women's Network, and we were under the Trump uh, administration, a very different, a very different relationship had been established in that, you know, there was no relationship really there was a there was a consul general who was trying his best to you know represent uh, but also clearly was having difficulties with washington um, because you had an administration that was chopping the national endowment for the arts that was cutting support to, to arts and humanities subjects and these kind of peripheral issues in Europe didn't seem to be that important. So, you know, it, it comes and goes. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a pendulum, you know, it, it, it swings, it'll come back again. It's also interesting, just to finish off, it's interesting to see how our membership comes and goes as well. Whenever there's a, a Republican in the White House, membership falls off quite radically. And then when the Democrats return, we get an uptick again in membership. So, Let's see. Hopefully, Biden will bring us a few more members. Well, if I could follow up with a question, it's kind of related, which has to do with the funding of American studies. Traditionally, uh, I was sort of amused to see that one of the uh, one American studies scholar, I think it was uh, an Austrian gentleman, referred to the funding fathers, um, which is um, you know referring back to Rockefeller, Ford Foundation grants, and this sort of thing, American uh, government grants, presumably various scholarships and so forth from those early years and how that's evolved. I mean, uh, my understanding, and I could be quite wrong, was that a lot of that funding dried up and, but in a sense that was more or less startup funding. So 
uh, allowing American studies programs in different universities across Europe to get established. Um, and sort of once they were established, sort of beyond just being uh, uh, sort of a peripheral member of the academy, to actually be more, uh, you know, uh, um, included in the um, in the organization of the university um, mm -hmm. on a more permanent basis, that is, um, that you know that sort of went away. But that there was also this notion that when the money away, that there was also sort of a liberating feeling about it as well. Uh, I was just wondering about sort of your 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 views both on uh, any important trends in the funding of American studies in Europe. Maybe, for example, after the end of the Cold War, there was some more in Eastern Europe than there was, or, or you know, than there was in Western yeah. Europe, something like this. But also your view about how that's been interpreted within within Europe and within sort of the European American Studies Network. I th well, oh, that's, there's a lot in that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, if you actually pay attention to the Fulbright papers around 1947-48, when he's driving this, these these bills through through Senate and Congress, uh, he he's quite honest about it. In which he's like he's trying to pull a fast one. He's sort of going, yeah, here's all this surplus money which we're not doing anything with, and we can't repatriate. So why don't we use it for this? But actually, it's been used for something quite different. It it, it seems to be, you know. And very much part of that sort of Truman period where there is an attempt to uh, academically colonize Europe in some ways to to spread that influence of uh, of American democracy and American values through state supported funding. Now that does continue through uh, the Kennedy administration and uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Then we get to Nixon, and then things kind of dry up, <laughs> uh, and the seventies all becomes a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, admired in Vietnam, and those kind of, uh, those policies and those funds then become redirected and redistributed for uh, American conflicts elsewhere, and then you know continually Afghanistan, Gulf War, Afghanistan again, you know, um, I think it's really interesting the point you make about post Cold War and the fall of uh, the former Soviet republics. Because yes, a lot of American attention goes into those regions in the early 1990s, uh, and not just you know in terms of American studies in universities, but you also see American corporations moving moving things there, uh, and as a result of that, you do see the beginning of uh, American studies or American literature, American history curricula in universities and uh, in educational settings in those countries at that period. Um, and it also, you know, depending on where America's interest is, then you'll see a rise in support or a rise in philanthropic funding. And whether that, you know, whether that philanthropic funding is um, independent or, or has been sort of, there's been a nudge and the government has said, why don't you put some money into this? So certainly in Ireland, you know, during the time of the Clinton presidency, up to the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, massive amounts of money came in to Ireland uh, from the United States, and at the same time, a very large increase in the registrations of students and universities doing American studies modules. I don't think there's a coincidence. Uh, and it's the same, same in, in the UK, uh, but now, and certainly one of the things in the UK we've seen in the last 15 years, 20 years, certainly since George W. Bush, uh, is a drop off in American studies. There used to be dedicated American studies degree programs. Now there's very few. The home of American studies in the UK was Keele University. That American studies program has now been closed for five or six years. So you, you do see that sort of, you know, it comes and then it disappears and it's moved much further east. So one of the main centers for American studies beyond Berlin is Warsaw. Um, they have an amazing American studies center out in Warsaw, which is a fantastic city as well, if you ever get the chance to visit it. But it's really interesting to see, you know, where the kind of, the, you know, follow the money, obviously, and just see where it moves. Uh, and wherever American studies is springing up, there has been a concerted effort to bring it to fruition. Uh, Warsaw is a big uh, location. It's under pressure in other locations like Belarus, uh, Russia, um, Turkey as well. So Erdogan has been very, uh, very particular about blocking academics going to American conferences, for example. Um, 
We have a similar issue in Hungary, where the government there has withdrawn funding for gender studies programs. Uh, and these were always connected to American literature and American studies um, degree programs. So there is a kind of pushback against that American influence. And even most recently, this year, last year in France, where there has been kickback against critical race theory and against uh, the Islamification of uh, the, the French of French society, it is deemed because of American studies, uh, the leakage into into France of American studies motifs, um, which is interesting and wrong, but you know it's interesting to watch it. So th th there's a kind of there's kind of a double wave. There's the financial one that that funds things, and then there's also the kind of critical um, cultural one that sort of comes and goes. With every with every change of administration in Washington. Uh, so we have about uh, just under ten minutes. I have a couple of more questions for you, if I might. Uh, so the first one is actually just as you know, in your position, do you have any contact with sort of similar uh, people in similar positions in Africa or Asia or South America? Um, you, know, you know, is it? Do you, do you sort of get any interaction with those sorts of folks or, you know, I'm not sure if there is an Asian Association of American Studies or if it's just the Japanese Association or something like this. Uh, yeah, it's continental more, wide. It's, yeah, it's not really continental wide. There's more kind of pockets of individual scholars. So there's two people in Malaysia who are always in contact. Um, and then there's a, an American Studies Association um, in uh, Australia, New Zealand. and. Anzaz, Anzaz, I can't remember the, the acronym. Um, so they're, 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 pretty, they're pretty productive. Um, and uh, South America, no. Uh, obviously, North America, there's the American Studies Association. Um, so, you know, we have a kind of uh, return um, recognition of each other's association. So, you know, we pay the same kind of fees to conferences and we try to go to their annual conferences. but. They change their their president every year, uh, <laughs> which probably might be a good thing. <laughs> I don't know, um, but it means it's very hard to keep track. You sort of you, you just get to know somebody and then they're gone. You're like, oh right, and now you're doing something completely different. Um, the American Studies Association (ASA), um, you know, it's an interesting. It, it in itself is an interesting study, just to look at it. And and you know, recent years, um, there's been a lot of controversy about boycotts of Israeli institutions and the divestment policies and you know that that has been a tricky one for the ASA to manage and it's lost a lot of members as a result and some have come to us some have come to a much broader association called the International American Studies Association IASA uh, and they they are sort of transnational so you know that that one and us would probably be the sort of the two most international versions um, I'm sure there are, you know, if, if I could travel to Argentina and Brazil, which I would very much like to, uh, uh, I'm sure I, would, I could find uh, enough American studies scholars to have a chat about things. And I, I noticed in the, um, in the summer 2019 edition of the, uh, the European Journal of American Studies, an article by Michael Barton. Uh, he was joining... Uh, Fairly substantial group of critics of the American Studies Association uh, contrasted this with American Studies in Europe, and he concluded by saying that American Studies might be better off in the hands of the Europeans than in American hands. So, you know, do the Europeans do it better? I, I just think doing American subjects in non-American contexts allows for a very, a very different. And I think maybe less, less politicized, is that the word I want? I just think currently American studies in the United States is prone to falling on that division that is about being woke uh, or not, about being right wing or not, about supporting Trump or, you know, reality. <laughs> uh, you know, those, those issues, because I, I, I do think there, there is a there's a, a cleavage within the United States at the moment, into which questions of the study of the United States 
uh, is falling in on itself, whereas it should actually be, um, you know, the thing that shores up American studies. But you know, the, the, the argument over critical race theory, I think, is a case in point. And I think you can do that from a from an external context in a kind of safer space, maybe uh, critically, intellectually, uh, than if if you're in the United States and you have to, you know, have an allegiance to one one code or the other, one side or another. So I, I do think that, you know, and there's also a lot of American academics have come to Europe um, since the Trump regime. Uh, so there's also that, and you yourself, I don't know how long you've been in Europe, Jeffrey, but, uh, you know, you know, so there's a lot of people who have left. Yes, I'd say since 2005, so. Uh, oh, okay, well then, you know. Well, <laughs> it was the Bush times. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just, it's really interesting. I think, you know, I, I just personally find it more interesting. I do think American academics, when they come over and they hear how we talk about there and they are quite surprised. They hear things that they had not necessarily thought they would hear. I think it would be the same, you know, for any of us. I think, you know, someone talking to me from outside of Northern Ireland or Ireland, about the situation here you know first of all they'd say it's crazy uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, and you know yeah you're right um you know that i think that distance critical distance political dif distance uh i think that can really help distill uh some of the more central arguments that that aren't just about america but are about 21st century living are about how we deal with the past about how we prepare for the fact that the planet is on fire. You know, all of those things which are very complicated and political within the United States, I think there's, there's a space beyond that nation at the moment that allows for a, a better engagement. Well, one final question, if I might, um, and, and that has to do with, you know, if I was in the United States right now and doing, say, a, a course about European studies, um, yeah, which of course might involve a great deal of culture and so forth, but there might be a, a more obvious connection uh, that might otherwise be the case in sort of a European context. That I'd be part of a sort of an area studies, uh, you know, I'd be an area studies um, expert who might you know work in government, advise the government, or something like this. Do you see any of that in Europe, or or have any sort of even rumors of that? Like the people who do American studies. Uh, you know, are they re regarded as American experts who then go work for governments, or is that just that not really done? I mean, I've, to be honest, I'm, I'm sort of asking out of curiosity because I've not seen that. Uh, you know, I, I know back, you know, during the Soviet Union, you need to have, you know, American experts who worked for the Soviet government, and, you know, that's what they did. But mm. more recently, I, I sort of, especially in Western Europe, I don't get the sense that that's any, anybody bothers to do that. I was just wondering your impressions. Yeah, I, I just, I don't think there is in Western Western Europe. Um, you know, you will have a few people who are friends with ambassadors and, and, and officials like that, and maybe, you know, they can, you know, nod towards an issue. But I don't think it is so much of, a, you know, the, the, the lines of communication, the channels of communication used to be much more open between academia and public policy, government, embassies, all of that, the State Department even, um, you know, I used to be able to go to the Consul General here in, in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, and, you know, you'd be able to have a chat about stuff and, and that, you know, whether it gets to the ear of somebody in, in the State Department or not, it's, you know, at least you're getting to have that. You don't have it anymore. It's gone and, and it's gone quite quickly. It was certainly there in the 1990s. It's not there now. Now, whether if you're in, you know, if you're in Poland or maybe in Russia, uh, you know, you there's a very different economy going on there in terms of intellect uh, and knowledge and how that is being positioned and manipulated so there's a very close eye kept on people who are teaching american subjects in that part of the world now whether they are part of a a governmental structure uh, i i wouldn't like to speculate but no i i haven't i've not met anyone who's sort of secretly working for the cia or anything like that no no no, no. And, and to be honest i wasn't thinking about that i mean i was more thinking in terms of you know advisor to the french government or german government or something like this you know because not really no not not really um, you know i think it would be actually interesting if the american government was to to realize you know the kind of the extent of american studies work in europe and how 
you know, the, the, the pushback against American subjects in different locations is a kind of early canary in the coal mine about, you know, pushback against other things, whether it's democracy and, and, a, and a move to the right in, in certain European countries that are further east, without naming yeah. names. Yes, I just wonder, I just I wonder how much is, is is just a change in the cult in, in terms of the mindset of, of of the State Department itself in terms of the sort of things that they care about relative to what it was back say during the Cold War when it was more more of a competition for influence yeah and so absolutely. forth although right. although sort of yeah. with, with, with the sort of more recent version perhaps of you know, Confucius in institutes or something like this as the, you know, the the China influence might be. I well, you know, I, I think I think that might be a, a landscape where there will be some concern uh, about how the Confucius Institutes have come into uh, European institutions and, and what that means and, and what it means for Chinese policy. Um, I, yeah, and, you know, Biden and um, uh, Blinken both made comments about Belarus and the Lukashenko regime and what that meant for intellectuals, what it meant for you know, freedom and democracy and all of the things that you'd expect them to defend. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if they if they follow through in any of these things. I know they're caught up in a lot of domestic issues at the moment, but there there are questions about that sense of democracy and liberty and freedom that are on the line in certain countries at the moment. And, and American studies is at that sort of interface where it's being sort of dumbed down or silenced or withdrawn from universities. And I think the State Department might be well advised to keep an eye on that. Yes, um, I think um, uh, perhaps overdue, but uh, sadly, uh, um, uh, my views certainly aren't heard. Uh, so, uh, but, but, <laughs> well, but I'll perhaps, find but, but perhaps any, you need to pass it on. Yes, perhaps in, in, in some sort of rational system, uh, yeah, they might be slightly more interested than that. But um, my expectations are generally low when it comes to uh, uh, the State yeah. Department, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, right. Well, look, as, as it's a few minutes past 7 p.m., I'm afraid I, I should bring this session to a close. Uh, okay. Professor McGowan, thank you so much for a uh, superb presentation, which I found quite fascinating. And, and I you know, really appreciate you providing a very different perspective on on how America has studied and how that has evolved, you know, from your vantage point as head of the European Association of American Studies. Uh, you know, I certainly learned a great deal and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat encouraged and hopefully others are as well uh, to attend, uh, hopefully, you know, the, the Madrid conference uh, yeah. next April. Uh, fingers crossed that that goes ahead without any, uh, any, any problems. Um, yeah. Before leaving, I would just like to uh, remind uh, everyone that the next session in the series will be this Thursday with Professor Sarah Snyder of American University speaking on the topic of US, uh, the evolution of US human rights policy. So I look forward to seeing you then and uh, yeah, wishing all of you a very pleasant remainder of the evening. And Professor McGowan, thank you again so much.